Yay, we're in the last section of chapter two. Yay, we did it. Good job, you guys. If you made it this far, you have the patience of a saint and the attention span of... Uh, I don't know. What has a long attention span? I don't know. I don't have a long enough attention span to think about it, if you know what I mean. So, section 2.8, talking about the distance and midpoint formulas, which you should have seen if you took, you know, first or second semester algebra. I think here, at, you know, MJC, it's, it's covered in first semester, but, you know, it depends on the school you went to and if you used Common Core or what, who knows. All kinds of things affect it. So those should be review, although if they're not or you forgot, it'll be fine. We'll go through it. And then circles, which you should have seen maybe a little before, but if not, that's okay too. That's probably probably a little less likely you've seen that. All right, so what are we talking about here? Round and round, okay. In 1893, George Washington Gale Ferris, that's an interesting name, Junior, oh sorry, Junior, not the first of his kind, designed and built the first Ferris wheel as the centerpiece for the world's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. That was a long time ago, huh? Did you know Ferris wheels have been around that long? Very interesting. So it says, the rectangular coordinate system gives us a unique way of knowing a circle. It enables us to translate a circle's geometric definition into an algebraic equation. In this section, we will learn and then apply these algebraic techniques. So first we talk about, yeah, um, distance between two points and then the midpoint. And then we'll talk about circles. All right, so like I said, these, this part, the first part with the distance and the midpoint formula, it should be review. But if it's not, don't worry, it's not a big deal. All they are use um, formulas. So here, here's the distance formula. That's the guy. You know, like highlight them and make them look more important. Distance formula. And then it's a lot like, remember the section where we reviewed how to find the equation of a line. There's an x2 and a y2. There's an x1 and a y1. So it's not a bad idea to label them like the points we were given here. I'm going to call the first point x1 and y1, negative 1 and negative 3. And the second point, x2 and y2, um, 2 and 3. And then you're just substituting them in, you know. You go, <clears throat> the first part of this formula is a x2. That comes from this guy, a 2. So that's why they replaced it there. And then the x1 is negative 1, so that should go there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then y2 is 3. That guy should go here. And then y1 is negative 3. So you're just, first of all, you're just replacing, and then you're simplifying. You know, inside the first parentheses, the 2 minus negative 1 makes 3, and then you're squaring that. In the second parentheses, 3 minus negative 3 makes 6, and you're squaring that. So if you square each of those, you get 9 and 36, respectively. You add those together, and then you simplify the root. And this is a perfectly fine answer, but notice that in the problem they said, express the answer in simplified radical form, which we did, the circled guy right there. But they also want rounded to two decimal places, so you put that in your calculator. Calculator. And then round it to two decimal places, or however many decimal places they ask for. So that's the idea behind that. Now let's, let's get our hands dirty here and have a good time with this problem. So okay, I know from the free problem we just did, or the problem we just followed along with, the distance formula should like, look like the square root of parentheses x2 minus x1 squared plus parentheses y2 minus y1 squared. All right, and then I fill in, um, you know, the x2 and the y2, the x1 and the y1. All right, let me label these guys here. We got, I'll call this first point x1 and y1, and then the second point we'll call x2 and y2. That way I fill everything in correctly. So first, first thing I'm supposed to have is negative 6 because that's x2. And then y2 goes here, that's 3. All right, and then in the first parentheses, the second part of it is x1, that's 4. And then in the second parentheses, the y1 is negative 1. So be careful, you have a subtraction sign from the formula itself, and then a negative from the number itself. So what's in the first parentheses, negative 6 minus 4, that'll simplify to negative 10. I'll have to square that. And then in the second parentheses, 3 minus negative 1 is 4. I'm going to square that. So we go 10 squared, well, negative 10 squared is still 100, 4 squared is 16, and if you add those together, you get 116, okay. And that, you know, that's, that's the answer, but you might want to simplify that. I think 4 is the only thing that goes into this that has a square root, because that's, that's the idea now as I say, okay, I don't think 116 has a square root, but maybe something goes into it that does. This is 4 times what? 
It's 4 times 29. So I can rewrite this guy as the square root of 4 times the square root of 29, because I want this in simplified radical form. And the square root of 4, there is a square root of 4 too. There is no square root of 29, so I'll just leave it. So that's the simplified answer, but they also want the, um, the answer corrected two decimal places. So I'm going to go to my calculator here, type this in, and then round it to two decimal places. All right, now I'm getting 10.77 would be the rounded answer. Huh. So yeah, not too bad. I mean, as long as you have the formula or you've memorized the formula and you know, you know how to label these things, then it should be not too bad. And the second formula is pretty similar. Um, let's see. Well, I guess, let me see. You probably already know this, but just to be safe, what we're trying to do right now is, um, well, the first objective that we found was you're given two points, and I don't know what they are. I don't know where they are on the XY coordinate system, but here they are. First, the first formula we just kind of played around with was having to find the distance between them. So if I were to draw the straight um, line segment between them and I measured it, that's the distance. So that's pretty self-explanatory. The next thing we want to know is what's the midpoint between them. So who's the guy that's right in the middle? This guy right here. So that would be the midpoint. It's some kind of x, y value, you know? So I should expect the formula for the, for the uh, midpoint to be some kind of point, which it is. If you notice in this highlighted area here, the midpoint has an x value. It's calculated by kind of like the average of the two x values of the points, you know? If you average two things, you add them together and then divide by two. And the same thing with the y values. You know, if you want to find the y value that's the average of the two, you add them together and divide by two. So we'll try. Let's try to find the midpoint between these guys. I'm going to call this x1, y1, oops, and x2, y2. Then I'll plug them in the formula. x1 plus x2 over 2, y1 plus y2 over 2. So let's see, x1, the way I labeled it is 1, <clears throat> plus the other x value, 7, over 2. And I'll simplify that in a second. And then we have y1, which is 2, plus y2, which is negative 3, over 2. The, the very left coordinate simplifies to 8 over 2. And the, the right coordinate simplifies to a half. And so, you know, the half, there's not, oh, sorry, negative a half. The half I can't really do much with because it's as simplified as it gets. But the 8 over 2, of course, that's a whole number 4. So I'd say, yeah, if, if the 2 divides unevenly, then go ahead and do it. But if it doesn't, just leave it as a fraction. That's fine. All right, let's try to do that one more time with these new points. This is x1 and y1, x2 and y2. All right, the midpoint should look like x1 plus x2 over 2 for the x-coordinate, y1 plus y2 over 2 for the y-coordinate. x1 is 6 plus x2 is 2 over 2, and then y1 is 8 plus y2 is 4 over 2. All right, let's add those guys together. 6 and 2 is 8. 8 and 4 is 12. And both of those have 2 dividing into them evenly, so they're going to have whole numbers, 4 and 6. There we go. And if you want, you could plot those guys. Like So the two points that we were given to begin with, 6 and 8. Let's see, 6, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. All right. There he is. There's 6, 8. And the other point I was given is 2, 4, that's about here. And then the point that I think is the midpoint, I mean the one I found, is 4, 6. Let me plot that guy. 4, up 6. So that kind of looks like the midpoint, right? It looks like it's right in the middle. I think if it doesn't, if it's a little off, maybe it's because you scale the axes a little weird like me. Yeah, but that looks good. All right, well, that seems about right. All right, now we're finally getting into circles. So this might be new to you, it might not be... But let's see. Dun, 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 dun. Um, so it says, the first objective is to write the standard form of a circle's equation. Um, and they have it written here. They kind of have, hit, have it hidden. This is the standard form of a circle's equation. If you want to highlight that or write it somewhere. Standard form of a circle's equation. All right. So it's um, just, to, just to kind of label the parts of it. The x and the y in this um, formula... They're just part of the equation. Kind of like the equation of a line should always have an x and a y. So should the equation of a circle. But this h and k, these guys represent the center of the circle. h, k is the center of the circle. And then r here, you can probably guess what that is if you know circles. r is the radius. Yeah. And that should tell you everything you need to know about a circle. You know, if, I, if they said... 
Okay, the center is whatever, this point over here, and the radius is whatever, three, then I know exactly what it looks like. I just plot the center and then I go out three units all around. You know what I mean? So all you really need is the center and the uh, radius and you should be good. It's okay. Let's actually get to the example that they're asking about here. What does it say? Write the standard form of the equation of the circle with center zero, zero and radius four. So all they've done, I guess, just to kind of show the work, um, they start out with this kind of general, generic standard form of the equation where H and K and R, you don't really know. But they've told us, didn't they tell us the center was zero, zero? Is that right? Yeah, okay. So they're saying H, K is zero, zero, because that's the center. And then they said the radius was what now? Radius is four. So really all I have to do is replace those. Zero is H, so that's going to go here. Zero is also K, so that's going to go there. And then R is four. So that's really all you're having to do right now is just replace things. X minus H, which is zero. Y minus K, which is zero. And then R squared, R is four. So I'll put zeros for H and K and a four for R. And then if you, it's possible, try to simplify this. Obviously X minus zero is just X. Same thing with Y, Y minus zero is just Y. But four, I can square that, that's 16. So this is the, 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 uh, the standard form of the equation of a circle whose center is zero, zero, and whose radius is four. So that's, that was kind of interesting. Let's try that one more time, and then I think we'll pretty much get it from there. So they want us to, again, write the standard form of an equation. We're given us um, the center, so I'm going to label it. It's h comma k. h is always the x value, k is always the y value. If you get those mixed up, just remember alphabetical order, you know. x and then y, h and then k, and then the radius is 2. So they, like, the hardest part is probably kind of remembering, or trying to memorize the standard form, this equation of a standard form. x minus h in parentheses squared plus y minus k in parentheses squared equals r squared. And then my job is just replace h with the number given, replace k with the number given, replace r, and then just, if you can simplify, that's good. If you can't, that's okay. h is negative 1, okay, there we go. k is 4, all right, sounds good. And the radius is 2. All right. Well, in the first parentheses with x, all I really need to do is say, well, subtracting a negative 1 is really a plus, so I'm just going to write x plus 1 squared. But, you know, there's no need to actually write that twice and FOIL it out. You know, I don't have to write x plus 1 times x plus 1 and then FOIL that. No, they like you to leave it with the square on the outside. So really the simplifying is just done by if there are two negatives next to each other or I guess the radius, if you have a square on a number, you might as well square it. Other than that, though, there's not a lot of simplifying to do. They, they like you to leave the squares on the x and the y on the outside of the parentheses. I think it's because that way someone else, like if, you know, if you did all that work and then you presented someone with this and you said, hey, this is the equation of the circle, then they could still see the center here. The negative one and the four are kind of visible-ish. And then the radius they can kind of see because this is always the radius squared. So that, I just say, okay, they squared something to get four. That's the radius. Oh, it must be two because two squared is four. I think that's the idea of why you don't want to multiply this out. You want to leave the square. So it's still obvious what the uh, center and the radius are. All right, now this next one, the objective is you want to give them the center of the radius, sorry, the center and the radius of the circle whose equation is given. So they're giving, now it's kind of the opposite. Now they're giving us the equation and they want us to give them the center and the radius. So, okay, but one thing to notice is that, um, well, it didn't really happen in the first one we did, but in this one, notice, remember the center had a negative one as an X value, but notice that it became positive down here when I had it in the equation. And the y value was positive 4, but it became negative down here. So that's one thing to notice is that um, you kind of, you want to change the signs of h and k. You know, when, I guess when you go from equation to what is h and k, then you're going to want to change the sign. So with that said, my h comma k, well h is always going to be in the parentheses with x, but it's the opposite sign. So since I see a positive 3, I actually want a negative 3. Opposite signs as seen in the equation. And then similarly, the k value should always be in the parentheses with y. I see a negative 1, but I want to take the opposite sign, so I'll do positive 1. Um, and then the radius, as we've kind of seen before, or we kind of talked about, 
you know that somebody squared something to get this 4. So it's, it's pretty much you're square rooting the number on the other side of the equation. So it should be 2. Square root of the number on the right side. That's pretty much the idea. So that's how you can kind of systematically find the center and the radius of a circle if you're given the standard form of the equation. Change the signs of the h and the k. That'll be your hk, and then um, the radius, take the square root of the number on the other side. Okay, but now they want us to graph this circle, which I guess it depends how precise you want to be, because if I do this really quickly, then it might look really bad, but if I'm a little more precise, it'll look nicer. So just in, just in case, just to give you tips, let's see, what I would want to do is probably first to graph, I know it probably seems silly, but it kind of helps. I do first plot the center, of course, so I know what I'm centered around. Center. Okay, what did we say the center was? I already forgot. Negative 3, positive 1. Okay, so left 3, up 1. There he is. So this point should be the center. And then what I would do is from there, from the center, plot a point, whatever the radius is, so r equals 2, um, in this case, plot a point r equals 2 units left right above and below the center center that way i kind of have um an idea of how far out to go so from that center that red dot i've drawn i'm going to go left two units okay that would put me here i'm going to go right two units i'm starting at the center again that point negative three one go right two units from him all right now go back to that center negative three one go up two units and then go back to the center and go down two units so there's, there's four points that I've plotted. Oops, I didn't go. I put, I went uh, down three units on accident. Oops. Oopsies, that guy shouldn't matter. So they should look like they're all about equally spaced around that center. And then you just connect those four dots. There we go. That looks good. And technically, you know, that's, that's a fine graph, but um, the center isn't really part of the graph. That's just kind of there to help guide you to draw the circle, but... Once you have the circle, you don't really need that center anymore. Not that I wouldn't mark you wrong if you left that point there. You know, I wouldn't mark you any points off. But just so you know, a circle is just a circle. There's no center dot that needs to be plotted. It's only there to help you um, figure out what the graph looks like. All right, so let's try to do that one more time here. I think we'll get the hang of it now. So we want to figure out first from this equation what the center is. So remember, h, the h value, h, k h should come from the parentheses with x, so it should be a negative 3, but I'm changing the sign because it's always the opposite sign, so it'll be positive 3. And similarly for the k value, k is the number that's inside the parentheses with y, but since I see a negative number, I'm changing it to a positive. So the center is positive 3, 1, and then the radius, r, should be the square root of the number on the other side of the equation, so square root of 36 is 6. All right, so like we did before, I think I'll plot the center. Where's he? Three to the right, up one. And then from that center, I'm going to extend six units left, six units right, six units up, six units down, just so I have a kind of a benchmark of what points or yeah, what points to connect. So from that center, that point three, one, I'm going to go left six. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. There he is. And then I'll go right six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then I'm, so I'm always going back to the center before I move six, whichever direction. So back at the center, let me go up six. One, two, three, six. There we go. And then back to the center, I'll go down six. One, two, three, four, five, six. There we go. And those look like they're about equally spaced around that center. And then I just do my best to round out a circle that hits all those four points. Ah, oh, that looks so bad. Oh, well, you know, you do your best. That looks bad, but hey, what are you going to do? That's why, you know, I think I've said this before where... Sometimes I think my graph looks so bad, I say, man, if someone was grading this, would they even gr give me credit for it? Because it looks so crappy. But hey, you know what? You covered yourself because if someone says, man, this graph is ugly. But hey, look, at there's the center right there. There's the radius. So they're correct. They just are really bad at drawing. But you definitely don't get punished for that in a math class, I don't think. Maybe in art class. I don't know. I'm not sure. Da -da -da -da. All right. Oh, now we got something interesting going on. It says, use the graph from problem 4a to identify the domain and range. So kind of going back to an old concept we might have forgotten a little about, but that's okay. Remember, domain is all x values taken on by a function. So we'll list all those, and then range is the same, but for y values, all 
y value. So what I want to do is, for domain, for example, I want to say, how far left does the graph go, and then how far right does the graph go? So looking up at that graph, it looks like the very furthest to the left that the graph goes is negative 5. So I'm kind of look, looking at the x-axis here. Let's see. Negative 5, I think, is the furthest, and then to the right, it stops at negative 1. So that's what I want for a domain. I'm going to put that in, in interval, interval notation, negative 5 to negative 1. That's my answer. Negative 5 to negative 1, and then I'm either going to use parentheses next to those guys or brackets. In this case, I'm going to use brackets, and that's because there are actually points at negative 5 and 1. You know, that guy, there is a point there, so I'll include him. There is a point there, so I'll include him. So that's the domain, and then the range, let's see, let me try to use a different color. Um, the range is all y value, so let me look at that circle again. How high and how low does it go? Looks like the highest it goes is a y value of 3, and the lowest it goes is a y value of negative 1. So that'll be my range. I'm going to write that. Negative 1 to 3. And remember these, you always list interval notation from smallest to largest, since negative 1 was the smaller of the values I mentioned, and 3 was the larger. I'm going to write it like that. And again, brackets because there is actually a point that has a y value of negative 1, and there is actually a point that has a y value of 3. All right, I assume the next one they want us to do is for the other, yeah, okay, for the other um, circle. So we want domain, and again, that means you want all the x values, and then range is all the y values. So let's see. kind of helps me to color co coordinate here. Domain is going to be something or other. And it's how far left and right this graph goes. The furthest left I see it is at negative 3. It goes all the way. I see points going on in between up until, oops, sorry about that. Looks like 9 is the largest x value. So okay, this guy goes from negative 3 to 9. Similar to the last problem, it'll be um, brackets. All right, and then the range, let's see here. The range is all the y value, so how high and how low does it go? Looks like the lowest point is here, and that extends down to a y value of negative 5. The largest y value I see, I think, is that a 7? Yeah. So it looks like all y values are taken on in between from negative 5 to 7. So that'll be my domain. Negative 5 to 7. Or sorry, my range. Did I say domain? Negative 5 to 7. There he is. Let's see. Let's get those colors coordinated here. There we go. That's a beautiful thing. All right, so once you get the hang of finding the domain and range of a circle, it's not so bad. It's just kind of weird, I think, at first. All right, and this is, this is our last objective in this section. Oh, are you kind of sad? I'm kind of sad. Oh, but it's it's a it's a bummer because it's the hardest one. So this is, I guess, the worst case scenario. It's like, I always think of this as, you know what someone did? They took the equation of a circle, like the nice, beautiful ones we saw up here. Let's say, like this one, for example. Someone took this and they said, you don't have to write this down. This is just... Hopefully it helps you understand. Uh, da, 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 da. They said, oh, you know what? Maybe I should multiply this out. I'm going to go x minus 3 times x minus 3. And then I'll do y minus 1 times y minus 1. You know, because that's what the square means. You're, you're just complicating things, though. If I do that I'm gonna, and I multiply it out, I get x squared minus 6x plus 9 plus, okay, then y squared minus 2y plus 1. And then at that, that point, I mean, I guess you could say... Well, I'm going to move all the constant terms together. The 9 can move over. The 1 can move over. That way, all the terms that don't have a variable are together. Then I have x squared minus 6x. Those are not like terms. y squared minus 2y. Those are not like terms. But let's see. The 36 minus 9 minus 1. Is that 26? I think. So what if someone did that and then they said, here, there's the equation. Now you figure out what the center and the radius are. So what if, what if someone gave you that and they said, all right, graph that circle. What's the center of it and what's the radius of it? Oh my god, you'd be screwed. Because remember, what was the center and the radius of this thing? The center was 3, 1. Where the hell did that come from? I don't see a 3 or a 1 hanging out. The radius was a 6. Uh, I think it's just coincidence that this is a 6. That has nothing to do with the radius. Uh, so that's that's where, we, where we're at now. So what we want to do is be able to go backwards in that um, process. If we started with this guy, I want to be able to go backwards and go back to this thing. That's the idea. Someone screwed up this equation, and I want to make it look good again. So we have to use the process that you might have seen before called completing the square. Wait. Completing the graph. Sorry. Completing the square. What the hell? I should say completing the square. Oh, wow. So maybe maybe somewhere around here, I'm going to write the steps to this. Um, 
Maybe off to the side here. Step one, you want to get the x terms next to each other. And then same for y. You know, because notice they have x squared plus y squared and then plus 4x. So they kind of mixed up the x squareds and the and the x's and the y squareds and the y's. So I'm going to put x squared and then the 4x. So that way the, the two things with x are next to each other. And then I'll put the y squared and then the minus 4y minus 1. All right, and then what you want to do is move the constant term to the other side. And by constant term, I just mean the guy that doesn't have an x or a y attached. Move the constant, so that it would be that one in this case, the negative one. Term to the other side. So now I'll go, okay, move this one over, add one. Because you only want to see um, x's and y's on the left side. x squared plus 4x, okay, plus y squared. Minus 4y. Now it's equal to 1 because the 1's gone from the left side. All right, now we get to the steps that are hard to remember. Because, okay, what we're trying to do, if you, you know, if you want to relate it back to what we were talking about, we're trying to now figure out what we're missing is... Where are we? Oh, God, where am I? Oh, yeah, here. What we're missing is these numbers. This 9 and this 1, they, they were, I guess, what you needed to build x squared and 6x to make it look more like this guy, x minus 3 squared. And that 1 was needed to combine with the y squared and the minus 2y. Those three together made the y minus 1 squared. So we need to find those special numbers that'll, what they call complete the square here. Let's see, I, I like to call them magic numbers. I know it's, that's not really a technical term, so you won't see that in the math book. But it seems like magic. So I, let's see, what I want to do is find the, what I call magic number for x. Okay, how do you do that? You take half the coefficient of x of x then square it. Okay. And once you figure out that number, then you want to add this to both sides of the equation. Both sides of the equation and that should do it all right and we'll do that but then i just want to write down the next step which if you think oh my god this is going to be taken forever the, the next one is just do the exact same thing for y do the same for y so like it says it says it said here take half the coefficient of x but now it's take half the coefficient of y blah 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 all right. Well, there's a few more steps. Let me let me we could follow along with this. Um, so let's see the magic number for x. Magic number. So we said we're gonna find half the coefficient of x. So half of four. Let me see here. Half of four, and then whatever we get, we're supposed to square that. It says find half the coefficient of x and then square it. That's the idea. So let's see. Half of four is two, but I'm supposed to square that, and I get four. So this time it happens to be four. Okay. So that's the magic number for x. And then let's see, we're supposed to do the same thing for y. The magic number for y number. And you don't have to write this out. If you get really good at this, you probably can skip writing this out. Um, half of the coefficient of y is negative 4. So half of negative 4 squared. Half of negative 4 is negative 2. If I square that, I also get 4. So in this problem, it, hap it just so happens that x and y have the same magic number. Let me see, and then it says what we're supposed to do is add those to both sides. So I'm going to write the, what, the terms that were already there. Let's see, the x, x squared and the 4x. But now what I wanted to do is take this magic number 4 here and add it, because this these together are going to make a perfect square. I'm going to complete the square. Um, but I have to, what I have to do is add that to the other side of the equation as well, because you have to balance out an equation. You can't just do something to one side and not the other. So there was a 1 on the right side, but I added 4 to it. But something similar is going to happen with the y's. There was a y squared minus 4y, but the magic number I found for y was 4. So the, what I want to do is add that to both sides as well. And I should be that, um, let me highlight it, maybe that'll help. This portion here, the x squared, the 4x, and then that mag magic number we found for x, 
it should factor into a perfect square. So the next thing to do would be factor the first three terms into a perfect square. Same for the fourth, fifth, and sixth terms, you know, the y's. So let's see, um, the highlighted part. Let's see, it's x plus 4, x squared plus 4x plus 4. Let's see, if I think about that, that factors into x plus 2 times x plus 2, which I can write as x plus 2 quantity squared. So that's how the first three terms factor, just x plus 2 squared, like we said, because it's an x plus 2 times an x plus 2. And then the fourth, fifth, and sixth terms, the y squared minus 4y plus 4, that guy factors into y minus 2 times y minus 2. And those factors better be the same or else you can't write it as that guy squared. Now it's looking more like an equation of a circle, right? It looks like I see the center sort of forming now. Um, da -da -da -da, let's see. Okay. So that's that guy. And then on the right side, I guess I have three numbers adding together. I might as well combine those. 1 and 4 and 4 is 9. There we go. Combine. And that should be it. So it's, I think the hardest part of that is just remembering the freaking uh, how to find the magic number. That's a pain in the butt. But what did they want? Da -da -da. Oh, we did it. Okay. So that's the answer right there. This guy. And that way, if, if they ever ask for the center... Yeah, if they, have, if they ever ask you for the center and the radius, there they are. The center is... Remember, you change this guy's sign. Not that they ask for this, but just so you know. Um, you change the sign of the 2 with x, make it negative 2. I change the sign of the negative 2 with y, make it positive 2. So there's the center, and then the radius, remember, is the square root of the number on the other side. The square root of 9 would be 3. But they didn't ask for those things, but that's, I guess, the beauty of this, um, this process, writing it in standard form, because now someone could tell actually what the center and the radius are, and they could graph it if they wanted to. Ugh, that's a, it's a long process, though, so let's try that one more time. And then I think these definitely the more you practice these, the better you get. The hard part is trying to memorize kind of the steps. So the first thing we did was we got the x terms together. I'm going to write x squared, and then the 8x, and then the y squared, and the 2y, and then the 8, I guess. Okay, that was a step one. And then step two is to move the constant term over. So that 8, we don't want any... We only want variables on, on the left side. Anybody that's not a variable should go on the right side. Plus y squared minus 2y oh, equals 8. Okay, now it's time for the magic numbers. The magic number for x, let me see. I'm supposed to find half of the coefficient of x, which is 8 in this case, and then square it. All right. Half of 8 is 4. If I square that, I get 16. Okay. All this, though, this magic number, if you want, if you get good at this, you can just do that in your head and then add 16 to both sides. You don't really need to, I don't know, necessarily write that out if you get good at it. So if I want right here, I'm going to add 16 to both sides so I don't forget about it. And then the y's, they have their own magic number. I'm going to do a similar thing, but I'm finding half the coefficient of y. That'll be half of negative 2, and I'm squaring that. Let's see, half of negative 2 is negative 1. If I square that, I get positive 1. The positive one must be the magic number for y. I'm going to add that to both sides. Here we go. I think that looks good. Let me see. I kind of took up a lot of room with that magic number. Let me move this guy down here. It was x squared plus 8x. And then we added the 16. And then I'll just keep the same color so we know where it came from. And then it was plus y squared. Let's see. Plus y squared. Minus 2y. And then plus 1 was the magic number in blue. Okay, that looks good. Equals, okay, then all these guys over here you can combine if you want. Let's see, 8 and 16 is 24, plus 1 is 25. And a lot of times they'll make sure that that number adds up to something that um, actually has a square root, you know? So that the radius is nice. Alright, now what we're supposed to do is, let's see, that was step 3. Ah, I guess 3 and 4, huh? Because we found the magic numbers of x and y at the same time. Now step 5 was to com um, factor this guy x squared plus 8x plus 16 should factor into x plus 4, x plus 4. Let me see, maybe I'll stick with the green for that. 
Hope, hopefully no one's colorblind with blue and green, because this doesn't look very exciting, huh? Is that a thing, colorblind with blue and green? I don't know. But since those are the same factor, I can write it as x plus 4 quantity squared. Let me try to do something similar for y. We have y squared minus 2y plus 1. That factors into y minus 1 times y minus 1. Okay, and like I said, if you factor that, those should be the same factor or else something went wrong. Probably you found the wrong magic number. You might want to check your work. Or you're just factoring wrong. That could be too. So there we are. All right. That's the answer. And then, like I said, they didn't ask for it, but if you come across a problem where they do, just to practice, the center is, okay, I'm changing the sign of the number next to x, so negative 4, and I'm changing the sign of the number next to y, positive 1. The radius is the square root of the number that's on the other side of the equation, 25. So, oops, so we should get 5 for that guy. All right, we did it. We know a lot about circles now. Well, I know, when you were like, what, two years old, you thought you knew a lot about circles, huh? Well, that's math for you. Take something cute and simple makes it complicated. But anyway, thank you for listening. I'll see you in the next video. We'll start a new chapter in our lives. Isn't that exciting?